investigating how things change appearance and shape over time. Not just eroding or decaying, but also how new layers of growth emerge, is something that interests textile artist and maker Nerissa Cargill-Thompson. Initially trained in theatre design, her community arts practice saw her interest in fibre art grow with a desire to develop as an exhibiting artist. Documenting and responding to the changes she sees in the world around her, Nerissa makes work using old clothes and scrap materials. Through embellished textiles and cement cast in plastic waste, rows of crumpled bottles and discarded packaging, we can see the effect of human action but also the optimism of nature emerging. Highlighting the issue of plastic pollution and climate change, her recent sculptural work invites us to consider the packaging that we use and discard daily. Casting them in cement to make them heavy and solid, Nerissa hopes to convey the weight of the issue and the permanence of these disposables. By uniquely transforming these into works of art, Nerissa delivers a powerful message in a beautifully embellished package of colour, texture and form. Using recycled fabrics with embroidered additional marks and forms, dipped or cast in concrete, Nerissa illustrates how the discarded has become an unnatural part of our living landscape. With a beautiful sensory aspect to the colours and textures and textiles, cloth can not only hold stories from another time and place, but also evoke new narratives. Always looking for exciting juxtapositions of structure and colour, the contrast of nature and stone, coastal textures like lichens and limpets that cling to eroded rocks, or the growth in urban settings reminds us that nature finds a way to fight back. With an MA in textile practice from Manchester School of Art, Nerissa is also a member of Prison Textiles and the Precious Collective and Society of Embroidered Work. With many awards and exhibitions, public and community art projects under her belt, let's hear more about using what we have and how we can be inspired by it, and where our findings might take us. As we welcome you, wherever you are joining us from, and Nerissa Cargill-Thompson, this week's Friday Feature Artist. Hello, Arissa, welcome. Thank you. And before we get started, I wanted to welcome everyone that's joining us today and welcome back to a brand new season, so which is exciting for us. And uh, to everyone out there, we know that sometimes that'll be in the future. But if you're joining us tonight, this evening, today, this morning, um, please let us know where you're tuning in from and feel free to let us know and pop questions and comments in the box as we go, as we um, would love to um, hear from you. So we've already got a few people joining us. So that's great that we've got um, Vivian from the UK and people from Australia too. So that's nice to be um, in, in both time zones. So speaking of the UK and London, um, You've just wrapped up attending uh, Decorex in London, which is described as a showcase for interior design. So could you tell us a little bit about what you exhibited and how was it? That, yeah, it, it is very glitzy. It is, it, is, it is big. And yeah, I did feel, uh, on, on day one, I felt such an imposter because I'm, yeah, this, this little, I work in my shed, in my garden, it's just me. But I was on a, I was on a stand with um, Design Nation, which is an umbrella organisation for designer makers. So we're, we were all kind of artists and makers, sort of things. And then, yeah, there were these big companies with their big stands and, uh, yeah, trying to talk about kind of the cost of craft and things like that and feeling a bit bad and then going, that's how much? So, yeah, it was this, this kind of big glitz yeah. thing. Uh, and I was showing my uh, Coastal Dreams collection. So the three panels that you saw in the video, uh, I had those. Uh, I had my chair, which is covered in that fabric. And I also had a couple of my mixed media bottles uh, hung on the wall as wow. well. And so, yeah. kind of, and it was quite good because a lot of the stuff is so big, and people were, could just go, "Ah, oh, that's a rug, that's a light," but actually, with mine, they go, "That's a," yeah. and they don't know, uh, which is quite. So they would come forward, and I would tell them all about it, and I'd have my samples, and I'd let them feel it, and and actually being able to go, 
um, this is made from old clothes, that this is old suits, uh, yeah. cast and litter, because sustainability was very much a, a topic and a buzzword around kind of the industry at the moment, because uh, the interior design industry, I think, and building, it's something like 40% of emissions. So they are kind of very conscious and they are trying to move forward. Though uh, how much of that I couldn't see. So to be able to go, look, this this isn't just, pretending to be sustainable this this really is there are layers of sustainability yeah, yeah, within this yeah. world i noticed on the decorex website um there's a, a link like a video and they do a fly through kind of like a um somewhere between a drone and a and a blow fly camera you know all through the sort of uh, mm-hmm. aisles and, um, and and that was quite amazing because as you say like I, I thought that kind of had um everything from beautiful things for beautiful people but then i was imagining that somewhere buried in that there's kind of the mindfully crafted sustainable products um, there is that we felt we were in the wrong we were in the grand hall and actually the the other hall um there was a a makers area which we were all very jealous of and things uh, so there were a collection of uh, artists and makers who were were making in their spaces yeah yeah that's and it's great that they could incorporate that and broaden it to that and and get away from that sort of um the gold and the glitz and and um you know that sort of oops, what am I doing high end um interior product um, yeah because there was this big kind of uh, glass table with with um metallic octopuses under it <laughs> the most ostentatious thing you've seen in your life but <laughs> that, that whole sea thing kind of connects <laughs> yes, yes, that's showing um uh, you know care for the environment so um as you mentioned the coastal dreams so this was this one of the pieces that you had but, on but, but yes and in trying to keep with the whole sustainability thing uh i uh did it by public transport so i traveled what? on the tram and then the train and uh then uh the bus to decorate with my chair and my three panels and my two concrete bottles then i got the overland back to to euston and the train home yeah so yeah wow. actually got a lot of oh is this what british rails come to oh got to bring your own yeah a lot of that but Actually, I think I had a smoother time than those people who were trying to hit, were trying to drive in London, were tra- parking in London, trying to hit that kind of half hour slot for drop off and pick up. And yeah, so- yeah, that's so interesting, isn't it? Um, I haven't done that much exhibition work, but the couple of things I have done, I'm always pleased that when I go to deliver it or pick it up, it kind of seems to either fit in a tiny little box and I can kind of put it on one arm as I leave. And I think, note to self, always remember that you have to be able to, you know, ideally carry said item yeah. yourself. So. That was one of the things whilst working, you know, in textiles, so yeah, that, you know, light and things. And then I discovered concrete. So. Yes, so we are doing it. And so I'm just going to show up. So that was one of the other um, panels that you yeah. had on display as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so as you, and we're going to go into this, but essentially these pieces are made from reclaimed, recycled textiles. Is that That's, that's correct. The, I, I use a base of old suit trousers um, because your old jeans and things like that, people do the gardening, they paint the house in them. But old suit trousers, you know, who wants wants them that uh and because of my background in in theater particularly community theater i've spent many years trawling the really cheap charity shops for costumes and props and things so i was really aware of how much kind of clothing waste uh, as a society we were bringing um and how cheap it was as a as a resource and and so it's rather than using vintage fabrics it's very much next stop landfill the the fabrics and clothing that I use and suit trousers are often made of beautiful fabrics that Mm -hmm. I tend to pick something which has got at least a two-tone weave going through it lots of tweeds and things like things with a good wool content um you know that you often find kind of that uh uh Afterlife clear out, dead men's clothes kind yes. of thing. You can often find you see that, and yeah, sort of suits which may not have seen the light of day for kind of 30 years and are all dry clean only. So, yeah. so yeah, people aren't yeah. going to really want them as clothing. So, yeah, I uh, just dis- deconstruct them and use them as my base. 
uh, and then I work into them uh, from behind with other scraps of clothing with kind of scarves and blouses and t-shirts and things like that. Mm, that yeah that and I, first of all I'm thinking hmm Sydney wool and tweed suits probably won't be in my local charity shop but at least uh, where you are there's there's more of that around I would imagine so that is excellent um, and as you say always interesting to know what the the backing substrate is for textiles so you mentioned just there about um, background in theatre design and so you know, as soon as I hear those words, theatre, design, my reaction is one of, and I'm going to say this, gushy wowness, but I'm sure you just go, theatre, design, amazing. Um, but I'm sure like any job, it had ups and downs. But could you tell us either a little bit about kind of things that you made or perhaps a couple of memorable highlights from that time at all? Or... Um... <laughs> You know, just, just delve into that kind of. The, um, I very early on uh, became uh, head of design for Manchester Youth Theatre uh, and I spent four years as head of design for Manchester Youth Theatre and as part of that I took kind of a group of young people through the making of the, the set, the the paintwork, the making of the props. Uh, and even back then that uh, using recycled textiles was was kind of part of my thing. When, you know, that was way back in the 90s. Uh, and uh, I made a set for um, Blood Wedding and we had this forest and this tr these trees which were made out of um, chicken wire and that had uh, old fabrics woven through them so it was a woven forest. And because the audience had to enter through the forest and things like that, we'd scented them with um, cedar wood, a cedar oh. oil and things like that, and sandwood. So they smelled and they had these textures of hessians and and tweeds and wools and things. I also made, also for um, the, we did As You Like It. Yeah, it was As You Like It. And I made, we, we set it in uh, kind of the arts and craft era and um, the trees, the, these big panels which turned around, it, trees, and they were done kind of in patchworks of, of greens and things like that. Wow. So that, so that was quite nice. Um, I became, I, so once, you, once you've done a lot of uh, community theatre and things, you get a bit of a stamp of, oh, you do education and community. And you kind of, uh, for a while, it was a bit frustrating. It's the whole, I've done, I've done a show with 50 people on a budget this big. Imagine what I can do with a budget this big and five people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, but it just didn't quite work. And then um, in becoming a parent, the, the whole nature of uh traditional theatre schedules is tough and so actually at that point I was quite glad of the community side of things and by that point I'd also started working as associate artist with a couple of disability-led companies uh, which I still do uh, work with them and one of them uh, we're in the middle of developing and testing a piece it's they're a learning disabled company of adults and they devise work and they go into learning disabled schools with these pieces and we've been creating a sensory piece about uh, the forest and nature and things oh. and that's all been made using old clothes Thing and there's these kind of yeah these foresty drapes all made with old clothing and the, the there's bits on the the costumes which they there's a lot of one on one and so there's touchy sensory uh, elements yeah. to to the performance not just vis visuals. Um, mm -hmm. I was a co artistic director of a street theatre company and that meant uh, a lot of I did a lot of mask making and big heads and things like that and so I've always been very much a designer maker even in, in my in my theatre life and yeah in moving into into textiles things I knew at that point I kind of wanted to work kind of three-dimensional that I had ideas before doing my MA of of wanting to use some of those those kind of mask making skills in, mm. in making my things. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so in um, preparation for this, like the word sensory kept coming up all the time and mm. kind of just think, oh, yeah, tactile. But then when you talked about that in that learning um, situation, it, I was 
just about to sort of ask is, is it based on that sensory thing? Because it reminds me of um, those books for children or um, I think... Really That's not my... Uh... <laughs> but you know how for visually impaired... That's not my they, dog. It's too, they also too do dog. that, um, you know, like the, the touching of the textiles because... Um, you know, for um, people with less vision, that's the touching thing that can really convey mm -hmm. something else. And then the smell, like that's really interesting because you kind of go, oh, walking through all those mouldy old, you know, like smelly textiles, but replacing it with the cedar wood, that is, um, yeah, that's really interesting yeah. because multi-sensory indeed. Okay, so now um, I'm going through a little bit of your uh, snapshot of your life. So then um, I was reading about you that you did your MA, so how did that kind of help you on your creative path? Um, did you know what you were going to do before you signed up for it? Well, I'd had, I'd had this inkling of wanting to do something three-dimensional and I wanted to use textile waste. I'd always kind of started that and I wanted it, I wanted to explore the idea of waste and value, um, that idea of, 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 things that are discarded, the thing of pollution and litter, but also that that thing of of uh, things being discarded, having a value, and in the sense of me as well, as as um, as always getting older and as an older artist and an uh, older woman, that that uh, that whole sense of, of of value and what of being left behind and left on the shelf and still having something more to give and so in a way there was this kind of two kind of thing of of there was the old clothes being given a new life and in in a way through the MA and that work I was starting a new life mm, yeah that, that that's um yeah that, that that'll make Deep, eh? <laughs> perfect sense yeah I, I, and so do you have any advice for anyone who's thinking about whether they need or want to do an MA? Like it sounds like it was benefiting you. It was. I think because I was making very much a a, a new, um, even though I was already in the arts, it was definitely a very new arena for me, a new sector of the arts. And I think in making that change and developing that um, personal voice and that personal practice, it was really important, uh, particularly mm. once again, as kind of uh, a, a, a mum and part of a family, that whole thing as a freelancer, that thing, I'm, I must be finding the next project, where is the next bill being paid from, all of that yeah. side of things. And, you know, I can't just go and play in my studio, that there's just too much guilt. Whereas once I was doing an MA, and I was it was working towards the MA and that MA was going to get me better jobs or, you know, things like that, develop my career, that that kind of took that burden, that guilt away. And so that kind of permission to play was uh, that the MA gave me was very important. And so it's kind of whether whether you're at a point in your life that you you kind of need that kind of time and permission that yeah. I think some people who in a way already have uh, kind of their their practice and things like that uh I would say you know I don't I don't know if it's yeah. the same for you but it, I think if if you're finding you're at a bit of a stuck point it can be very freeing it's moving mm -hmm. forward so I read that um, uh, in one of the articles um, that you said about the permission to play thing, uh, not permission to play, permission to um, experiment. Um, and I thought, yeah, that makes sense. But uh, interesting then linking that to the guilt word, because I think so many of us have experienced um, guilt. Like you just, and, and people often misconstrue and misunderstand that doing something creative is work and it's a job and there is that sort of substitute for play and so I think guilt is something that we've all experienced when we're making something so yeah that, that's really interesting in that context so I'm going to get to the images because that's one of the reasons I'm here so um the transforming the throwaway items um I'm going to show message in a bottle and so kind of 
How did that begin? And was it something that you worked with even before you introduced the concrete aspect, the idea of the throwaway? That, yes, and when I, because uh, that's one of the things that you see on the beach a lot is the bottles washed up and there is this, the, the whole message in a bottle, that, that that message from the sea put in a bottle. But also in the city, I see these bottles washed up into the gutter and I often very mm. much feel that the gutter is is kind of the strand line of the city um that where things things gather that where's the detritus gathers in the way that when you look walking along the beach you've got that line uh, yeah. of detritus yeah. there and also that knowledge that actually that same bottle is the bottle that's going to get washed down into into our drains and our water systems and is the bottle which eventually ends up out at sea that it the bottles on the coast are not dropped there they tend to be dropped in our cities um and so they're they're quite a symbol and they're quite red at first i i started working with uh milk bottles rather than drinks bottles that then i did start picking up water bottles and very much thinking about particularly I, I i live in manchester and we have really good water there is no need for anybody to yeah have to buy a bottle of water in Manchester that you know yeah. is is that good and that whole thing of 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 water and and needing it and this all this plastic polluting our water uh, <laughs> it felt wrong but so I started with milk bottles and I started with covering them and kind of using some of those those kind of mask things of 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 covering and but it just didn't have the presence that I want it 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 uh, it kind of was this uh, twisted milk bottle shaped rock um, with the textures and the and the um, I I think I used real limpets at that point laying them on and it just yeah it didn't have have the presence that yeah. I needed so then I. I thought I need a bit of weight in it. Uh, and uh, I did some experiments with plaster, but I also started experimenting with the concrete because I just had a, an extension done and there was there was a uh, half a bag of it um, hanging about my house and in that whole waste not want not ethos. So I thought, right, let's uh, try this, <laughs> give this a go. So yeah, it's, it is household concrete and cement that I use I don't use kind of some artisan art shop concrete um, yeah. and so I kind of I I then kind of lined things uh, and tried filling them with concrete and I also start tried kind of casting the bottles in concrete and then adding the textiles and um, it had more presence and more weight but I do need to show that image now just in case people missed it in the intro. Unless people picked it up. And so I think the piece which which kind of really uh started this journey and got it was when I half covered a um mushroom box and I, I when I placed the fabrics, I placed them inside the the plastic. Uh so I placed it inside, and so when I cast it half of the box was cast and had the um textiles and then the other half had the all the embossed um grooves and pattern from the vegetable box and that kind of went ah and that seeing yeah. seeing the plastic seeing that it was this man made thing and then the textiles that 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 juxtaposition of these um these worlds these textures that 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 kind of kind of went ping and that seeing in casting them together rather than sticking the textiles on afterwards that it really felt like it was growing on the rock growing on the plastic rather than just added after and and yeah and from there i've just yeah continued to develop the thing yeah, I mean, I can't stop looking at them. Um, so I will just show that again. And that idea of the multiples and the idea of 
flatten thing. I mean, I guess that sometimes they do get flattened by cars, but you often see people flattening them as though that's going to reduce the impact of it somehow. And then you've got that sort of crushed, um, you know, sort of... Um, yeah, I, I find know. it flattened. Yeah, I there's something that. about flattened that just sort of adds to the statement as well, doesn't it? Yeah, that I, I never make a mould. So even when I'm working in multiples, um, I don't make a mould because unfortunately there's enough of uh, litter out there to to make one each time that I've just done a piece for a gallery of 10 green bottles hanging on a wall of 10 individual bottles, which yeah. will be soon in a, in a shoal. <laughs> wow, that, that sounds great. And so I've got a picture of you here in action. So, yeah. um, that's me casting mountains of madness so that's and so you can see the, the all the individual uh sandwich boxes there uh but because because they've got the, the point that i've had to kind of fashion this thing out of uh yeah bits of wood which were around the studio and things to try and balance them so that i could fill them Oh yes, and so here's the how they turned out too. Yeah, that it, it's a thing, and sometimes they go when you get that that uh, proposal for exhibitions, and they go, "How big is it?" And it's like, "Well, it's twenty. <laughs> it's this many of these, so you can you can you can have a play." And so I let uh, with this piece, I'd like to uh, let curators, in a way, choose choose their their layout i said as, as as long as you channel that that thing of knowing it knowing you're making a landscape yeah them. and hopefully you didn't have to carry them on your duffel bag on the bus for that one because maybe they add up in weight um, they do add up in weight but actually they they pack it that i tend they end up i tend to carry things around in um freezer bags because they're okay. nice and added and weight that I, t I find it's a lot easier to carry. Um. Yeah. And uh, so I've got uh, another process shot here. And so this illustrates too what you were saying about how the textiles are embedded in the casting process rather than stuck on afterwards. Yeah, so I stitch them in to keep them, uh, to keep them in position so that I am still revealing what I want to reveal but also if I didn't it, it just gets sucked uh into the con it would float so it would get sucked in so so yeah I yeah. have to stitch the textiles into the into the plastic before casting I love that and then this is the finished piece behind yeah. the cap so could you tell us a little bit more about the thinking behind the concept um it's that um thing in in cities uh, where you have nature coming through the gaps that uh, in kind of brick walls, in our pavements, things like that, that that that, that nature crawling, craw creeping in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so true. And often I think those are the things that we're drawn to as well, like to photograph. And, um, yeah, I read that um, that you're always noticing and you've got the camera and, and looking on the yeah. hunt for inspiration. Um, but clearly you take that to the next level of actually doing something with all the shots that you've got on your phone or your camera. As well. Yes, I've had a, had a lot of conversations this week from people going, oh, yes, I'm always photographing Lycan and, oh, that reminds me of my, yeah, the, the photos I took when I was on holiday and things like that. So, yeah, yeah. people often connect with the fact that, that they also like kind of noticing and taking those photos. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. And um, so dying to show my favourite piece. So when, you you know, you see a piece of work and you read the title and then at the same time the reaction, and I'm speaking from my personal experience, is just like, yes, and wow. And so this one of yours, that was the reaction that I had. Um, and also the power of the multiples here too, I think, just... You know, on so many levels, you just have that reaction. Could you tell us a bit more about uh, when you created it? I mean, I think we all know the thinking behind it, but, um, yeah, if you could just maybe tell us a little bit more about that one. Yes, that, that whole anticipation of, like, which which is her favourite <laughs> kind of thing. Um, the, the, yeah, so that one is a set of four that I have 
also displayed uh, a set of, I think it was 11 or 12, you might know, it may have been more of them on a stick because it came from, it was inspired by a headline I saw in the paper, which, and there was a photo of a man with a stick of driftwood with just um, mask after mask mm -hmm. hanging off it. And the headline said that they think that there's now more masks in the sea than jellyfish. Okay. And that just really hit. And uh, because already in my practice, uh, I was responding to the litter that I saw on the school run and things like that. There was a real change in the litter when COVID hit that there weren't the sandwich boxes and the disposable drinks bottles because people weren't going to work and weren't out and about. And there were, what there were were the gloves and the masks. And often the gloves would be, be there and they would look as though they still had hands in. The masks would be twisted. Some people kind of twisted them and, and hung them like little kind of cocoons off trees in the way mm. people do with dog poo as well. Um, that uh, So, but unlike before when I could cast in the litter, I couldn't exactly cast in in, in COVID litter. Uh, that a, uh, a there was the whole health and safety issues, but also uh, the strength of it, it being uh, a, a fabric that I would have had to kind of build something. Um, so instead of so instead I I used household packaging, uh, domestic packaging, which is uh, what I cast in a lot during uh, lockdown. That that kind of yeah meat and food and cheese that particularly with the masks it was kind of smaller ones so that often kind of get cheese and bacon and things like that and I would twist them to to try and mimic the way um that I'd seen the discarded masks twisted um and I applied my uh, textiles, the the coastal textiles, because of the fact that I knew that they were all they were ending up in in the sea, uh, mm. and I embedded the elastic at the point of of casting, so that I had and I coloured the I coloured the concrete as well to mm. try and match the the most common colour of of disposable mask. Yeah, yeah, all those things just coming together, and it was a really conflicting time of. Um, seeing that rubbish and then kind of wanting to do something and then also how we were just completely over concerned with um touching everything and not touching our face and all of that um uh yeah it was uh, very difficult um i just want to say that there is a little bit of um buffering and uh, glitchy of the internet but we're, we're doing the best we can with the technology and we just uh, hope that uh, yeah the cats stay away from the cables and um, in the meantime yes I agree this is all just fascinating and um, going back to when we were talking before about um, trying to um, permission to experiment and I agree so yes and uh, Viv also has a good tip for the um, steam cleaning of secondhand clothes to get rid of the smell. So the, that sometimes I find rather than than um, kind of smelly, they sometimes I find uh, there's an overpowering um, scented scented washing powder thing. And, yes. Uh, yeah, I tend to rewash all of them that come through my house because because actually I find that more of an issue nasally than than. Oh. It's kind of multiple. Start on that. So a um, couple of things I wanted to mention was um, in, the, oh, I'll just put this back to here. Um, this book, you're in Anne Goddard's um, Mixed Media Textile Art with your page of um, lovely concrete creations. Um, and we also did a talk with um, the author and artist Anne Goddard. So if anyone's uh, looking for more um, to research in that sort of area with a different material, um, that is a great book. Um, so yeah, going back to that idea of um, uh, the pursuit of the textiles and uh, when you were talking about um, uh, and on the hunt for those textiles before. And I was thinking, so as you were sourcing fabric in uh, charity shops, do you always have like the quest in mind or do you ever get seduced by something? So, you know, like a luscious velvet or a sparkle or 
brocade. And is there anything that springs to mind where you just had to have it because it was just... <laughs> but, um, there is the bags of stuff and the particular type of textiles that I know that work within this work. But I also work as a facilitator. I run a lot of textile workshops. Um, and so I also have that eye out looking for things which which will go for that. So a lovely brocade or a velvet is really good when I'm make, doing my Apple workshop with people. And then there's kind of other things like cords and stuff, which which are really good in in kind of landscape collage. Um, so so yeah, that that I have different ha different kind of bags and different projects in mind when I'm going. That I have certain uh, charity shops I've, that I go to, which where everything's a pound. There's one with the Bernardo's ones where it has a trug, where all the trousers are two pairs for a pound and then the kids stuff is five items oh. for a pound. So if I'm just needing a little pop of a particular colour, that that the, the kids stuff and also you get some really lovely prints on kids yeah. clothes. So I do a lot of workshops trying to encourage other people to see their charity shops and waste clothing as a resource that that kind of to use that because also it's been washed a lot so it's really nice to handle you're not dealing um with uh processed dyes and things like that because some people react either nasally or skin wise to some of the dyes that are used in printing fabric yeah yeah so true i mean it's very hard when i do this because my mind suddenly goes into all these different things that i'm thinking of um other things but yes I'm bringing myself back to um uh so I I turn up with a big bag of clothes and it looks like one of my workshops just basically looks like a jumble sale until we, when I go in and work with kids they find it hilarious yeah yeah because you can just I mean already I'm there I'm like you know I'm going for the green things I'm going for the things that have the sort of little sort of um like shag you know that kind of um tufty mm -hmm. stuff um and so also also an item of clothing will have it'll have trim there'll be the trim as well yeah. as the main fabric and and they may go to completely different projects and things like that that you know i i have been uh swayed purely by a bit of trim when when you're talking a pound and that amount of trim or that amount of beading yeah yeah plus then you know what to do with it next with all the other stuff yeah. and i'm going to get to the embellisher but before we get to that so um, we talked a little bit about how you're using your phone and you're always looking and um, these are some of your photos and I think we can see by now how you how you translated those. Um, and then I was asking you the other day if you um, had a sketchbook or if you work with samples and you mentioned the idea of the sketch box. So could you tell us what a sketch box is and then could we talk about samples? that um when i even when i was at college that i didn't really use a sketchbook that we were taught at that point to have a sketch folder to it was it was in the days before camera phones and the internet oh, and being oh. able to so so all, all of our research was was kind of things out of magazines and stuff like that or photos we'd printed out and stuff and so our drawings that we were taught to to have it kind of loose so that we could um either lay it out on on the table or on a wall that you could make those connections and see those connections um so that kind of looseness of of keeping everything free and, and it being able to to find those relationships go, stems back to that and yeah. kind of pre kind of things being digital and then as i kind of started to move forward with things that um are three dimensional or have have that presence that that you know a textile is is it has even if it's a flat piece of textile it has depth it has texture and rather than yes yeah, sticking them into a book that having them them loose and then being able to to put them up so I've got kind of small samples and scraps and off cuts from other projects and so I can see how they would would work with things but also I have here that when I'm doing samples I've got 
how how different mixes of concrete will take mm. and will they take the embossing so there you can uh, recognize the symbol on that one mm. and yeah and here's uh, where's the camera there we go yeah you can see okay, yeah, yeah. it really takes the kind of the detail so i've got yeah small small bits of that that's one which uh, has got a a color in it and a scrap and so i yeah testing testing things out and small things and in that box also might be a twig with some lichen on or a shell and things like that that i've picked up so so that kind of the real the real stuff and the research alongside my experiments mm. and i love that thing of being able to make the connections with the hands like literally um, have stuff in a box and I'm think, thinking now I could have multiple boxes for different sort of projects oh yeah like, yeah you have multiple sketchbooks in multiple boxes. yeah instead yeah. of one sketchbook that I never use I can have sketch boxes of bits and pieces that I can connect so um yeah I love the sound of that so the I mentioned quickly this embellisher so this is uh well you could tell us it's a not a sewing so, machine it is <laughs> So it, it's a mechanical form of needle felting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got a set of needles, uh, but no thread. And and so basically, yeah. And then electricity rather than your hand going da 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 da, because this, particularly as you start to work bigger and bigger, that that would be uh, exhausting. Uh, so, yeah. so, yeah, so it mechanically does it. And generally you would felt... Um, from above and use it as a felting machine uh, for joining fabrics uh, without using stitch as well. You can use it for piecing stuff together as well as for texturing. Uh, but I work from behind basically mashing fabrics through. So, oh, oh dear. Uh, so you can see here that there are um, different fabrics behind there and there's different fabrics right. behind there. And because kind of when I use a cotton, it will go quite loopy, but when I use a kind of bit of wild scarf, it's kind of more hairy. A T-shirt's a kind of a bit bobbly. That, um, that, so I've got the different textures coming through as well as the differences in tones. And, and so that, I think it's that different in, difference in texture which really starts to kind of capture nature because because nature isn't kind of uniform. Yeah, and so not only are you deconstructing the garment, you're actually deconstructing the, the kind of the fibre in the in the cloth so that it um, mm -hmm. is no longer woven together. All the yeah. threads then just meshed in and, and through that machine it does that. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes like I like I quite like a uh, uh, an a. Uh, uh, a printed an ugly printed blouse or something like that because then i've already got a bit of pattern and mix of colors already done for me that it's another thing that i encourage in my workshops is let the textiles let your starting textiles do some of the work for you yes yes i did read that and i wondered what you meant by that and that that is really interesting I'd imagine it'd be quite a good little stress relief too, just having that thing and then just kind of making them. But that's you know, quite it's loud. It's quite yeah. loud. <laughs> but stress, I mean, the, I less... stress, but I would actually need headphones on at the same time. Yeah, um, it's just for the 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 uh, stress reliefing bit is when I get to sit and uh, watch something like Bake Off and do the hand stitching on the shell motifs. <laughs> Now, I don't even know why I'm asking this, but um, do you ever have many uh, work fails where the textile work is destroyed in the process or? That, that sometimes I layer things up a bit too much and, and they kind of start to give up the ghost because it's, you know, I am weakening them and, and uh, depending on the base, base fabric, whether it's been strong enough uh, in working bigger, uh, I've had to, when I first started making the panel pieces, uh, rather than just the sculptural work, um, I started making those during COVID because I couldn't go and cast in the studio, whereas I do my textiles in a shed in my garden. Um, that those were the size which fitted on a on a on a trouser. So then I had to start to develop 
how do I work bigger? And so I now have to piece together. And so those are even more delicate. And so they will often, they may come up away and I then just bring in that whole mending head. That whole, mm. <laughs> anyway, so, so I kind of, yes, sometimes along the way, the work needs mended as part, <laughs> as part of the process. Yeah, you have to do um, the thing. Yeah. Making so the big that, pieces. Was this some of what you were talking about just then in panels or? Maybe. No, as in the the panels that I've been showing in Decorex. Oh, oh so, okay, yeah, of course. So, yeah. so the, those panels are bigger than a trouser leg. Um, yeah. And I think you showed it earlier that so because they, they're pieced together because I couldn't do three panels. Yeah, them. I can't do three of them in one pair of trousers, that they've got multiple yeah. pairs of trousers in the backing. And you can see the stripes, which actually add to that sense of strata and rock. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, they become quite delicate, especially once I've then mashed lots of others and they've got the weight of the new textiles. So then the, I back them usually with some uh, old curtain lining because I've used the front of the curtain for a banners workshop. So yeah, you can see. And then that whole thing of Bora, the tradition of Bora of, of repair from Japan using the sashi, sas, yeah, sashiko yeah. stitch that through way. it to strengthen it and that means it's then uh strong enough to then mount over the panels which i tend to be use uh ugly art from from charity shops uh there's a that that triptych has got a, you know a a black and white cityscape we've all um, seen them we, you know them yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, or for then out there. using yeah. for upholstery that that it's then strong enough for that because yeah that, that sometimes there's a weakness mm -hmm. and sometimes the other fail is is sometimes when when the the concrete just creep in this in take creeps in too much uh, <laughs> and I haven't revealed as much as I wanted to reveal oh. or I take it out too early and uh snapping bottlenecks you know yeah yeah. So that detail that I showed before is mm -hmm. also part of this larger piece. Mm -hmm. um, could you just tell us a little bit about the thought behind that one? That that goes back to that idea of the fact that our plastic is ending up in every corner of our world, whether people are there or or not that we have the um, the garbage patches in our oceans, which are kind of in a way land masses formed of plastic where pe where people don't live. Um, so I created a, a world map uh, using my technique of embellishing, use, using kind of suiting as my base for it, um, and using um, a traditional. Topographical, is that the, the right word? Yeah, topographical uh, one. So I used the colours from the map into, into uh, choosing my fabrics when embellishing the textures. And then, yeah, I laid out all these panels that I chose. Um, I chose household plastics, which had a grid formation. So uh, to then kind of reference the, the lines on a map, of, of longitude and latitude wow. the grids on the map so yeah I can't even begin to imagine how you plotted and planned that um so that it came together and just says what it needs to so brilliantly That's but yeah that, that it was you know quite stressful and also this was at the beginning of lockdown I did cast this in my back garden I nearly lost Alaska over the, the side fence um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing, that photograph of it is on my kitchen floor <laughs> things like that yeah I've got lots of photographs of my cat sitting in the middle of the world <laughs> but yeah and, um, it was it plotted and, and I made the whole map and then cut, cutting that map up and putting it into the diff, stitching it into the different um, panels and things mm -hmm. that, that yeah there were kind of moments of <gasps> Is this mm. going to work? Because yeah, if one panel hadn't worked, then mm. that in the whole piece gone. And for me, um, you know, part of the I don't want to use the word success, but part of the thing that you do so well is um, well, it is successful. You know, you're communicating that message, um, but you're also doing it. Um, 
you know, not only in an engaging way, but it also, it's a beautiful way. And then, you know, to be able to then um, get the message across about the environmental impact. And then you have something like this piece. Um, so obviously we're looking at the plastics of um, balloons and the environment. But what also strikes me about this, I'm assuming this is the same piece, is the scale. That, that's just my shelf in my studio. With yeah, yeah. From other you don't know that um, the photo that I showed before is actually a sort of, and just the scale of, uh, I just think that's, I mean, I do love a shelf, but um, just to sort of see those pieces, the scale is interesting. There. I do find it weird that people ask about kind of the scale of my work and things like that, because I cast in real objects, they yeah. are real size, that my cup of coffee is the size of a cup of coffee and <laughs> things like that. Yeah, and we've all dealt with packaging at some point, so we all should be familiar with the size of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so kind of that idea that the, your textiles work is fitting into the um, sculpture realm. Um, and, you know, what do you see as the um, definition of contemporary textiles compared to craft? Do you, I mean, do you, they seem like they're, they're different. Um, I I think it's some sometimes to do with intention. I think you know you can ask the same thing about painting really as well. That that um, when things uh, are maybe purely decorative, which is not a bad thing. You know, we, we it's good to have decoration and and color in our lives, um, and so in some ways I've you know my panels are less contemporary than my my sculpture because there is is less of that that sense of of message there mm -hmm. and um people can find you your website and they can find you on instagram and i've also got a couple of pictures from your you have an online shop through folk folksy and um i noticed that you're wearing one of your own brooches and uh, these I I find it very useful as a name badge. So, yeah, in yes. doing Decorex, I was on a stand with seven other uh, artists and makers, and, yeah, we didn't have name badges, but I could go, look, I match my work. But I also um, make these out of my offcuts. Um, so to, once again, kind of continue in that sustainability, to limit my waste. But also <laughs> textiles takes a certain length of time, so... They, oh, it yes. has to have textile art has to have a certain price tag, which is often actually we still under <laughs> underprice it because we we kind of we're always kind of like oh about it, but uh, yeah. So in making my my jewellery with my offcuts, that people can have a piece of wearable textile art, individual, unique. So yeah, so that's was. Uh, kind of in a way is a a mini version of that map piece but yeah. somebody can can afford to to have and buy and and know they've got their own little map <laughs> so that what that one is small isn't it like that is a so yeah so that's casting biscuit packaging biscuit. oh so yeah so I, I i still with my brooches and things uh that this one's a pure test one and it is on a on a standard kind of shop bought thing but uh there's i also do the 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 round mixed media ones that you found that was a the dough balls a tray which dough balls came in that i do i've got little houses which some some dim sum came in so, so yeah the, i continue that that thing of of casting in in waste packaging mm. and then you've also got your um little textile panels too which are lovely um yes, but those are those are those are magnets you know so they're they're um yeah probably and then the textiles five by five yeah. and they're probably about 10 by 10 centimeters and so yeah 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 it's not lovely i just wanted to um show those as well because it's um nice to sort of show both ends of the spectrum um <laughs> so i was also um when we were talking about the reuse recycle thing and um, dealing in the community a lot, um, so the idea of encouraging people to reuse textiles that they have, mm -hmm. do any simple suggestions kind of spring to mind about like what's your kind of go-to of like 
yes, how can you? Because for me, it's like ripping up into cordage and coiling. But what else could I do with my textiles? It's, um, you know, there's a lot of beautiful prints out there. So, so they're really great for patchwork as well so in an artistic way or making making bags uh for um patching and mending and using small yeah. bits of one to applique and mend another thing to give so that another item of your clothing has a longer life um yeah. that uh old school polo shirts are great as a uh, cloths for, yeah. for wiping down so you can use you know sometimes you might want to use them for art but there's also just using using them uh as household things rather than getting using yeah. kitchen roll and and things like yeah. that there's a new zealand um author i think the, i forget her name but the make do mend book and i'm sure that had um mm -hmm. that reference about women in the 30s you know they start with the curtains and then they become clothes and yeah. then they bags and then they become cloths and then they become racks and you know we kind of need to yeah, yes, just, there is the whole there's the whole t-shirt yarn from old t-shirts, but uh, yeah, and applique using the, the smaller bits and rag rugging, you know that that it is we are harking harking back that it, it's not something new, it's something we are revisiting. Yeah, yeah, something we seem to have uh, slipped our minds. Um, and another thing that I really loved when we were talking the other day was about. Um, uh, so often we have the thinking through making, but you said thinking through unmaking, and um, yeah, because you were saying they rip things up. Clothing, particularly um, the suits, uh, I tend to uh, I deconstruct them down into panels. So I take the waistband off and I I split them into the the leg panels and actually just and take off the buttons and store the, them for something else. Um, so so yeah, in doing that, it's it's quite a a good time to focus and things i deconstruct the uh colorful ones far less so more likely just to hack a bit bit off <laughs> and think yeah. unless i'm going to a workshop where i'll often hack arms off lots of things if <laughs> if i'm doing an applique workshop uh, i'll take lots of of arms and leave the larger panels for for say banner projects where i might be want needing bigger sections and it means yeah. that I don't have to take quite as big a bag but I I, I love choice and I, I do I do kind of often take far too much stuff to my to my workshops because I like to give other people choice I, I love people having that rummage and go oh this reminds me of when I was young this oh, oh that's like my school dress was oh that's like my nan's curtains and that those connections that that people have yeah. with clothes and yeah and and getting them to deconstruct clothes get so that when I take it to a workshop it still is a is an item of clothing that I haven't sanitized them my workshop materials down to being purely fabric but getting people to make that process themselves that in getting them to deconstruct it they start to to see these old clothes and these things in the charity shops yeah. as just pieces of fabric. Cause you know, a maxi dress, a maxi, uh, you know, a lovely printed maxi dress. That's, that's kind of a good couple of meters of, of lovely cotton fabric and, yeah. and uh, you know, that yeah. can cost you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Two things that struck me there was that, um, you know, we keep talking about uh, cloth having stories and memories, but the fact that it um, triggers off other memories, you know, because sometimes it's like the hand-me-down fabric that has the special treasured memory. But also, yeah, like you just said, people have a connection to a pattern or something then that reminds them of um, something that they can relate to. So that that's really interesting. Houses that remind people of working in banks, things like that, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Or, or kind of travel, things that, that go, oh, yeah, that reminds me of kind of train seats. <laughs> that, <laughs> But yeah, that I think that's one of the reasons I I use textiles, and it was something that I in using textiles in my theatre work that you would choose as a theatre designer. You choose fabrics both within the set and within the costumes, which help tell the story of of those characters of that time and things like that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of time, instant. Yeah. See what I did there. Um, the time has just flown by. I still like I'm just had you know things, but. Um, 
you know, thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us. And um, yes, Vivian, also like just sharing your approach and hearing all those um, concepts and what we can do has been so inspiring. So um, that is so true. So just quickly, like what have you got, what are you working on now or what have you got um, that you're looking forward to next in your creative? That, uh, I'm looking forward to showing that, that, uh, that 10 green bottles piece that that the exhibition's coming up soon uh and the piece the uh, the pavement piece has been accepted for the prism exhibition so that'll be sh that'll be uh shown in london uh next april and i need to make another couple of pieces for that show as well uh and also we're heading towards christmas so i am going to be making more wrist warmers out of old jumpers uh and uh the smaller works and doing kind of the Christmas shows and the Christmas markets. Oh, that sounds lovely. And the thing about wrist warmers is they really work. And when we're all little crafting away or arting in our sheds in those uh, colder months, yep. warm hand warmers, they are excellent. Yes. Well, I'm just going to wrap that up now. And thank you to everyone who tuned in from wherever and in the future. We really appreciate you joining us for just kicking off this new season. And thank you, Narissa. I mean, as I said, those pieces, they're just incredible and your work is amazing. And But thank you for telling us all about it as well and, um, you know, sharing the actual the how and the why. So we really appreciate that. So everyone, you know the drill. Um, if you can share anything that you'd like to, um, you know, gratitude, thanks to Narissa, we'd really appreciate it. And um, yes, I'll play the outro and uh, bye for now and see everyone Hi. next time. Thanks, Narissa. Thank you.